Welcome today to Coping with COVID. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today, Zhao Wei Dong, a graduate of Oak Ridge High School in 2008. Zhao Wei came to Oak Ridge in 2006, came to the United States at the age of six from China. Zhao Wei graduated from Philadelphia University. It is now Thomas Jefferson University with a bachelor's of architecture and construction management in 2012. He is currently a construction manager in Chicago for a large pharmaceutical. He brings to the table so many different views on this pandemic in the United States that I think you're going to find fascinating. First of all, Zhao Wei is a Chinese American. The, the uh, relationship between the United States and China is complicated at this time. And Zhao Wei can bring some of that to the table for us. He also brings to the table the fact that his parents, his family, has had a small business in the Oak Ridge community for a long time. China Star on Apple Avenue is a great place to eat. And it recently just opened back up. And Zhao Wei's sister now owns the family business, the family business that Zhao Wei worked at when he was in high school. And finally, Zhao Wei brings a story to us. In January, to celebrate the Chinese New Year, Zhao Wei flew to China with his mom and his dad and his wife to celebrate the Chinese New Year and to meet his uh, grandma and grandpa. And um, one day after being in China, China locked down and the pandemic officially began. And so Zhao Wei was in quarantine in China for two weeks, flew out of China on one of the last flights that was allowed in back into the United States and has been in quarantine in Chicago since. We are honored and we are fortunate to welcome today Zhao Wei Dong, Oak Ridge class of 2008. Thank you. Um, to start, start off, introduce myself. Uh, as Mr. Wei say, I'm, my name is Zhao Wei Dong. Um, I'm class of 2008, but I didn't attend Oak Ridge until 2006 when our family took over uh, the restaurant um, in 2006. So prior to that, I, I was in nine different schools. So uh, that's a different story. But um, I, I graduated from Oak Ridge, um, went to Philadelphia University, um, studied architecture. Um, and then I, after that, I went to work for a contractor down in Houston. Now I am, a, I'm actually working for the pharmaceutical car company. In, based in Chicago, um, so I'm um, as their owner's rep or construction manager for all their projects, um, in charge, you know, directing and in charge of all the projects up in Chicago areas. I did not realize that you um, that you went to nine schools. Yeah, um, that, that's um, a lot of bouncing around. Was it all in Michigan? All over the place. Um, all over New York, New Jersey, Indiana. Illinois, Chicago areas, and um, Wisconsin, then Michigan was the last one. That, that's why when you see me on first uh, in a school, I'm not talking to anybody. <laughs> because to me, it's like, I know I'm gonna move. So they really don't make no sense to make any friends or get connected to anybody. So I'm kind of used to that routine. I remember you as a, as, a, as a diligent student, a quiet student, an excellent student in math, in that you were working, 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 working always at the China Star. How many hours a week were you working at the China Star? Uh, almost every day after school and all the weekends. Okay, so you were, you were putting in major time. When did, is that when you guys moved to Muskegon? When you, yep. when your folks, was it, was it a family owned restaurant before then? It, it was um, when we took over. So, and then we are just run by our family. We've been a family ourselves. So um, that's why I have to step in and work a lot. And it really is the only time we as a family spend time together in the restaurant. So, so that's why we, uh, I work a lot. And 
you know, and that and during that time, I have my own goal and thing I want to buy or the place I want to travel. So my mom would just t- tell me, if you work half a day, I pay you ten dollars for whole half a day, twenty dollars for a whole day. So that's how I save all my money uh, during that time. Now, when you went to um, college, where yep. out in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. what did what did you major in? What what did you study? I majored in uh, architecture. Um, so my minor in construction management. And, and then I picked you back up. You were down in Houston. You had gotten a yep. job uh, with, because Houston is building all the time. I mean, they've mm-hmm. got, you said they've got, they've got uh, high rises going up all the time. And mm-hmm. um, we, kind of got, we kind of got back in touch. I don't know, through Facebook or something. It was around the Chicago Cubs. I think it was when the yep. Cubs were, were starting to put together a series because you were a big Cubs fan. And we were talking online about the Cubs. And then, boom, all of a sudden, pop, you're up in Chicago as a contractor up in Chicago. I always want to move back so that I finally got a chance to move back here. Uh, I never thought I'd be a contractor. I was interested in architecture building. Um, so I'm more interested in architecture. Being the contractor, more or less, is when I think about my career. Um, how I wanted to, you know, my career to be, and I want to be more hands-on instead of um, drawing, this, making design. Or oh, I mean, design is fun; it's interesting. Uh, but being more hands-on and seeing uh, a, a product, a, a building that come from a paper being just being get built, and then you can see actual coming, in, in, put everything in places, give you a lot of sense of comp- accomplishment. It feel great after each project. So when you when you when you are a contractor, when you are a general contractor on one of these big projects, what exactly do you do? How does it work? So we are contract. Uh, we usually, you know, our company would take over the big contract. For example, the hospital, um, they would have superintendent on site, the sup, which is my position uh, originally. Um, I'll be managing and directing all this, all the all the you know, daily tasks on site. And you know, solving problems on sites and all this stuff. So pretty much everything belongs to the field that I will be managing everything in the field. So you're managing the entire project. Yes. And, and how long were you in Houston? I was in Houston for seven years. What would be an example of something that you worked on in Houston? Oh, uh, I do a lot of hospital project. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, I build a ER for farmers, uh, a hospital, build a PET CT, CT, uh, PET CT suite, radiology suite, uh, pharmaceutical suite. So all that, um, everything has related to healthcare. Also build lab for University of Houston, um, you know, a couple classrooms. So it's my main project, my main um, you know, role is building uh, in charge of most of a specialty project like that. Inside um, and outside? Inside, mostly inside an exist, I mean, operational hospital. Okay. So there's, that's that challenge right there that we have to do our work and also make sure that we're not affecting the hospital operations. So you're down in Houston for uh, seven years. And mm-hmm. um, I know that you had told me that you wanted to get back up this way. Yep. Why did you want to get back up this way? And how did you land in Chicago? So come up here obviously first thing is because the weather and it's just too hot down there and I can't stand it the weather is beautiful up here and secondly I mean one of the, I guess one of the most important that my family's up here so we I want to stay close to them um, but it kind of took it took away from my wife her because her family is down in Houston so uh, but we I able to convince her to come up here and it's been pretty pretty good um, how I come up here I got hired by an engineer company um, at first and who wanted to who want to relocate me up here to serve to work for this pharmaceutical company hey, okay you made a really good point and i think you guys all need to think about this as well when you hear Zhao Wei say i wanted to come back home and he says he's in chicago and he's three hours away that's back home that's back home i mean when you're down in houston you are a long ways away. You're a plane ride away. When you're in Chicago, 
you're a couple hours, a three hour drive away. And mm -hmm. so when you guys think about leaving home and looking for a career and going in certain directions, you got to think really hard. What's my circle? How far can I go? Well, I can go a whole lot further than Muskegon. I can be in Chicago. I can be in Cleveland. I can be in Detroit. I can be in Milwaukee. When we had Angelina on here last week, she still feels like she's home. She can get home and she can see mom and she can see dad and she can help out around the house. So when Zhao Wei says he's home, being in Chicago, even though it's three and a half hours away, is home. And so I think that's really been good for you. Uh, case in point, you're driving uh, home uh, the last week when I talked to you on the phone to help your sister get the, to get the um, store moving up. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, we, my parents still in China, so they kind of go around gathering all the PPEs that she can find. Um, she mailed it to me, so I have to, you know, last week when they decided to open, reopen the restaurant up, so I have to deliver those PPE over to them. Um, and then stay over there for a week and just help them in case it get extremely busy because, you know, my nephew is at home. So she want to make sure somebody can look after the kids. Um, so end up, I have to be over there help out as well. And my, thankfully my wife is there too, able to look after the kids. Um, when, you know, when we all in the restaurant working. So it's a team effort. It, it's a team effort. Yes. And it always has been. Yeah, from, from very early on, yes. You said that you were in China rounding up PPE. Explain mm -hmm. what PPE is and what you were rounding it up for and why it had to get to the China Star. Uh, PPE is, is you know, everybody should know, uh, what prior know is personal protected equipment. So, um, you know, and, and, and here we're talking about, um, mainly talk about masks, uh, you know, any, you know, masks that we can find. Um, in China, there is some masks available, mostly in our area. Um, you know, the government were passing out masks weekly basis to people, uh, but it's still hard to get. It's still hard to find by a, bunk, uh, a, a bunch of them. Uh, even in Chicago area, it'd probably be hard to find uh, a bunch of masks to, you know, to buy in bulk. So that's why my parents go around, um, really use their resources to find a channel to buy a mask in that large quantity. Um, it took them a while to get back he to here. Usually is the shipping costs right now is so expensive, it's, it's almost twice as much the actual cost of stuff that ship out here. Um, and they took about three weeks, almost a month to get here because there's no direct flight anymore. You have to reroute that had to route to Hong Kong and route to somewhere else before it made it to US. So, you know, so that's why the shipping shipment cost is so expensive right now compared to before. Um, so mainly that's what we did. We get a get bunch of face masks, uh, some gloves, and we did a route to my sisters. And so if you go into the China Star tonight to take out, because it's still takeout, then the PPE that that people are wearing there was from your mom and dad rounding that stuff up in China, sending it across the ocean to you, and then you driving it down to them. Correct, yes. Okay, cool. Um, which is necessary because you guys know, and we've talked to people, that uh, the United States has been sorely, uh, sorely short of PPE, mm -hmm. both in the, firstly in the hospitals. And so most of the PPE goes first to the hospital. And so if you don't have it at the hospital, how are you going to have it at the restaurant down the street? I mean, you have to keep, you have to keep your family protected. And so do they have enough to weather the storm? They have enough so far. Thankfully we not, we do not have that much employee and, you know, really the help department only require uh, people, you know, the cashier, the order taker, that people had to interact with the uh, customer to wear a PPE or a face mask. Um, the cook and everybody working in the kitchen is not required to have uh, to wear one. Um, so, which is good because you know it helped them out. It's very really hot in the in the kitchen. That it really helped them out a lot. So, uh, we should have enough for now. Um, you know, for 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 a while at least before 
you know, we ran out and we got a couple, I think we got 250 of it. Okay. And then how, did they have to make any changes inside the inside of the restaurant in order to make it safe so that they could, uh, so that they could open up? Yes. Um, yeah. If you see the picture or if you ever been to China Star recently, there's a huge glass wall, <laughs> you know, come and the counter go, go all the way across. Um, to, to just you know, we pretty much isolate our working area and the waiting area uh, completely. Okay. Uh, so to to protect our worker and also you know protect the, you know the clock customer, uh, we try to enforce you know six foot distance or minimum um, enforce you know limit them people going into a restaurant at the same time. Uh, but we know you know sometimes we it just we just can't control it. Once we feel like there's too much people winning in the waiting area, and my sister would decide to, we're not taking any more order until everybody left. Because okay. once they don't want anybody, we, we don't really don't want anybody to be you know, all crowded in that small space waiting area or uh, you know, being too much people. Um, so it's not safe. Thank you. Thank you. Delaney Lin, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah. So it was going back to what you said about. Um, you had to move schools a lot, and you yes. from, from China, correct? So you went from China and then you started going to schools in America. How did people treat you? Because you know you weren't like a foreign exchange student. You were like actually like I think you'd be immigrating, correct? From yeah. Treat you. Uh, I had a pretty good experience actually. Um, um, first school I went to is in New York City, um, and then we moved from places to places and because my dad's uh, during that time, he's working on starting a, fr a franchise business, you know, with a restaurant. So he set up a restaurant and moved to another place at city. He was set up and moved, set up and moved. So a lot of time um, I'll, I'll move with him, especially I'm the, you know, the youngest one. So I moved with them from, from city to city. Uh, that's why I changed a lot of school. My experience has been great. Uh, I can't, I, I, I don't have anything to complain about other than, you know, moving a lot and not able to know people. Um, and that's pretty much it. I am, after a few school, I'm just stopped talking to people and making friends. I just, you know, just do my own thing in school and nobody, you know, really come mess with me and stuff, so. Is that good, Delaney? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I have, uh, when you move seven times in schools, most of the time when you have kids that are moving and moving and moving, their, their studies collapse. I mean, you don't find people as, as successful as you have been academically and intellectually when you're moving all over the place. It just, it, it's just difficult. It's just hard to do. How are you able to keep your academics so high and then get into good colleges and get the career that you did. How did that happen? I think, I think it's more or less is our culture and Chinese culture we really, really uh, important in education. Um, so for even when I moved with my family, my parents, um, you, know, you know how a restaurant is, they operate from nine o'clock in the morning to, I don't know, maybe 11 o'clock at night and we never see each other. Um, I'll wake up myself, make my own breakfast, or don't have breakfast, just go to school uh, for 12 foot all the time in U.S. that we never have our parents wake up to drive me, unless I'm late or whatever, but they rarely had to drive me to school. Uh, always wake up on, on time, go to school on time, and just keep keeping that you know, mindset of I need to go to school um, you know, to improve myself otherwise, because we know how hard our family work and how much they sacrifice. Um, only way to get out that we know the only way to get out that circle is 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 to go to school. You know, do something different. Um, we don't want to be like them, and then um, you know, have our kid have you know able you know get the same childhood as we are. So that's you know that's one thing. That's the same mindset of me and my sister is that we want to work hard. And last thing we want is that we have our kids have shared the same childhood as we are. And historically, when did your parents come over? I mean, was that the when you, when you were uh, six or seven? Is that when they came to the U.S. and became U.S. citizens? My dad came over right after I was born, 
So I, I never met my dad until I was six. Will you explain that again? So he immigrated to, he got, came to U.S. when, right after I was born. So, you know, until six years old, you know, I never met my, really met my dad. Um, you know, I don't know what dad is because <laughs> never, never had one uh, until, you know, he came back and said, hey, you know, we're moving to America. And from there on, we, that's how, that's how it is. So, so um, yeah. Uh, that's a so huge sacrifice. Just, that's a huge yeah. family sacrifice for your dad to come over to this country to kind of put roots in mm -hmm. so that he could move your family over so that you could have a better life, I would assume. Mm -hmm. During that time, yes. And then you, your mom, your, is it just you and your sister? Me, my mom, and my sister, yeah. Okay, so then you all came over and mm -hmm. to New York the first time. Can I ask another one? Oh, Delaney Lind, you can ask questions all night long. So it's kind of off the point of what we were talking about, but um, how has, you know, moving and how has the pandemic affected you economically? How has it affected like your job and stuff like that? Um, not much. I'm, I'm lucky that I still have a job. Uh, you know, we, we are able to work from home. Me and my, both me and my wife were able to work from home um, during the pandemic, during the quarantine. Uh, me to me is a little bit more difficult because most of my project, my my works on site, um, since most of the project got been shut down during the pandemic, so I still have to go to on site time to time, but most based on um, appointment. If some if we have a future project coming up, I need to walk with a contractor or. Uh, or something that I have to do on a site, I will go to the job site. Uh, but more or less, we spend most of the time at home. Okay. Okay, let's talk about what happened to you when your family uh, flew over for the Buddhist New Year in January to China. So that time in January, I just changed my job from an engineer company to um, to worked before a pharmaceutical company. So we ha I have the break in between. So me and my wife decided, you know, we haven't been back to China to celebrate a Chinese New Year since we were kids. And um, that time, you know, we also heard, you know, our, our grandparents not doing too well. So we thought maybe this is the time that we go back and visit them. And at the same time, let's celebrate Chinese New Year um, for the first time for a very long time. Um, so my parents went before me, us, uh, they flew over before us. So, cause they had a lot to prepare and, you know, for Chinese New Year also took care of my, taking care of my grandparents. We flew over the first day we landed, you know, with the jack lad and all the stuff. Uh, woke up second day in the morning, um, a relative in the hospital was telling my dad that, hey, something's going on. Um, there's, a, there's a, you know, disease of virus going going around, tell us to be careful, don't go out. And really the next day, you know, um, you notice, you know, all the big events got canceled, all the movie, uh, all the Buckbuster movie that was supposed to come out during the New Year's time all got canceled. And really that night, I think that is the night before Chinese New Year Eve, night before Chinese New Year Eve, the announced the shutdown of Wuhan, city of Wuhan completely. Um, that's when we're like, what's going on? And then it's not much, uh, much time for people to prepare. Literally, the gov um, the city of Wuhan government come out and announced that at around noon and say by midnight, everything shut down. Nobody going in, nobody go out. And that's, that's what's it. Um, and then we move on to celebrate, you know, change. And, and then our, our local government where we at uh, about we we're, we're like six mile, 600 miles away from Wuhan. Um, so we tell us to you know, stay indoor as much as we can. Um, really our, our news is to just stay indoor as much as possible. Don't go out, only go out for essential travel. So you now moving to next day, and you know, we celebrate Chinese New Year Eve, Chinese New Year. I think the, the fourth day, our area announced, you know, they, they put in the really strict travel restriction from city to city and town to town. 
um, everybody going in and out have to get temperature check and you know you know there's a every toll booth being converted into a checkpoint for taking temperature they'll ask you where you come from all this stuff and taking your temperature um, and then they make sure that there were radio there's announcement everywhere that if you ask if you travel from Wuhan if you travel from from um, you know Hubei promise you have to be registered to the go local government or registered with the you know or, or somebody um, to make sure and so they can keep track of you uh, where to go and during that time you know my phone my phone is blowing up because you know my friends in the US tell me what's going on and then you know there's a, of course there's a lot of news and different kind of you know a lot of fake news going on here and there a lot of rumors or whatever going on all, all on the internet so there's a lot of confusion and people don't know what's going on and everybody is scared a lot of panic going on and it's first couple of days really really a lot of confusion and chaos uh, for the first couple of days definitely and so when you when you flew over, you had no idea that anything was wrong. I actually had some idea. I did watch news and heard something going on in Wuhan, um, but to me, that is like that's so far away. It's not gonna be a big deal. So I didn't. I I I didn't think it's big enough, and it bothered to mention. To my wife or whatever, I just like we're about to take it. Let's go, you know. Um, I actually heard the first news I heard in back in December. I think mid December I saw the news, something in Wuhan, but never really taken to heart. Like okay. this is something I should worry about. Uh, but you know, we really don't expect it would become like this. You know, in that short period of time, we thought they they got it, they can control it over there. You know, just feel people. You know, that's my initial thought. And you were there when it began to become really, really serious. Um, tell me some of the things that they did in China to get a handle on the virus. And the reason that they did this is they had so, so, so much fewer deaths than the United States because they got out in front of it quickly. Yeah, so... One thing they have to act quickly is they shut down Wuhan. They closed the entire quarantine, entire city of Wuhan. That is, city city itself about 11 million people, populations, and with all the metro area combined, you're talking about 19 million people, with all the suburbs all combined, and all and the sizes of it is just about the metro of Detroit, and you can imagine how dense populated that area is and. And just the way where it locate is located pretty much in the center of China, so it is a transportation hub for all high speed rail, all domestic airline, a, a, trans, a transportation hub. So everybody, a lot of people travel have to travel through there you now domestically. Either you're taking train, high speed rail, or airplane. So it's very difficult to control to shut down that city. Um, but they did. They shut it down right away once they they confirmed that the virus can be, you know, transferred from person to person, they shut it down completely. Nobody going in, nobody go out. And each local government are chasing down um, anybody from there a month prior. So they chasing down and track them, tell them to register. If they do not register, you know, they'll say they'll, they'll go to jail, whatever, they'll get punished. So, so they, do a lot of chasing down. Uh, we do, when well, first couple of days, we do have people knocking our door, ask where are you guys from? They wanna see a document, say, hey, you know, where are you guys from Wuhan? We say no, and they see a document, and you know, that's pretty much it. In the first couple of days, there's people knocking door to door, ask where, you, where you're from. Yeah, we have, they will give, give you a coupon, uh, entrance permit to go, they say each family, each household will get three ticket, two, three coupon per week, to let you go in and out of an apartment to buy groceries. So they pretty much, you can't go anywhere. Uh, you lock yourself into the apartment, uh, apartment and you know, if you want to go out, you can only use the coupon. So for, you use, okay, for so. A, for that time. You had, you kind of broke up there for yeah. a second. So you had coupons that would allow you three times out in a week. Did they have people that were, that were yeah. uh, guarding like the uh, entrance to the high rise? 
Yes, the the security guards. Okay. Each of uh, the building the building manager is a security guard. You know, the property manager they have security on site. Um, you know, just to guarding, make sure no nobody getting in. They check the ticket. Once you come in, they also check your temperature, make sure you're not getting any fevers, all that. So they were te- they were checking temperatures extremely early. I mean, this is a week into your trip from the United mm-hmm. States. Yeah, that's about a week into that. And what are we talking about? What uh, date are we talking about? Right before, end of January. End of January. Um, okay. Because yeah. the United States, we didn't do anything in February. We did, we did no social distancing. We did no masking. We did nothing in February. And we didn't start doing anything until March. And mm-hmm. so it, if you look at the countries around the world that have had really low death rates, it is because they did all of this work early. South Korea was testing people at that same time religiously. I mean, they had, they had people, they did drive-by testings. They were testing everybody everywhere. These countries and Germany did the same thing, whereas Italy didn't, and then Italy ran into huge problems. The United States didn't. The U.S. ran into huge problems. Great Britain didn't. They ran into huge problems. So you had to get this thing under control early. You told me something about the phones that was fascinating to me. Oh, yeah. Um, so really after a few days, um, because in China, if you ever go to China, you rely on your phone a lot. You do everything on your phone from payments to whatever, you know, did or, you know, did or giving and did or making appointments, whatever is on the phone. Um, so there is a app. As soon as it started, I think the second and third day, there is a, a, a web page on the phone that push, you, know, you can see get all the data, um, what happened in, in each individual area. And of course, at the very beginning, that rear app is not that complete as right now, but right now it's just like you can see all the data you want and you can chase down, you know, you can see right now it also has a, a health QR code on your phone. Yeah, what that is, is that? your pass, you go everywhere. It's a QR code, it's, it's just a code on your phone um, through that app that would show three color green, which means you're good. You can go anywhere you want. So if, if like, if I go to mall, I have to show that color green. There was the mall security was scan it. They'll take your temperature and they input that temperature in the system. Um, so let's say if I went to a mall and somebody went to the mall during that time, later test positive, my phone, my QR code will automatically become yellow so it means that I may be in contact with somebody test positive. Okay. So the recommendation was you had to, uh, you know, quarantine yourself at home for a week or more. Um, after a certain period of time, it really depends on location area. After a certain period of time, it will turn back green if you don't show any symptoms. And every time you go, every time you get your temperature checked, it's inputting into your phone information. So you're beginning to assemble all of this information on your phone so that you, if it's impossible if you are testing positive to move around, you, you, you are red. And if you're red, you quarantine. You can't move. Yeah. You can't if move. You're red, you can't move around. You can't. So even you leave your apartment complex, the security even can even check your phone and say, I want to see the QR code, you show them green, that you can go out. If you're red, then you can't go out. You have to go stay home. Uh, you. But if you, if you show red, it pretty much, pretty much I tell you to go straight to the hospital, get tested. Uh, it means that you're in very close contact with people. Uh, but you know the QR code, all that is after. It's, I think they got it out in late February. The whole QR code thing. Okay. Um, at the beginning, it's like nobody really know what's going. On. <laughs> nobody know what's doing. It's a little bit mess. And you know, they should try to put everything together. Um, they all care. You know, mostly focus on Wuhan itself. That's where we're at. And luckily, in our area, our city, we only have like seventy some reported cases. Um, only have one death in our city, um, which is population about ten million. Um, which is really good. Um, yeah. They contain it really well. They shut every all the highway down, check every person, you know. And you know, I think the biggest difference between how China deal with and U.S. dealing with is that you know they they I think they only have one area 
that has, is, is exploded with patients. So they shut lock their places down and then every other state or province, they send medical team to help them out. Okay. So, you know, we, we see, you know, we we see a news, uh, you know, about our local medical team assembled a couple hundred, uh, about a hundred medical team to send to Wuhan during, during New Year's Eve. So imagine, you know, they told you assemble to go help out in Wuhan and, and Christmas Eve, you know, after, right after your family celebrate. Uh, celebration so that's the amount of you know movement they have you know put the whole whole country in the effort to control it and they did they did yeah they did so, they did a good job no i just wanted to reiterate to people that uh you've got to understand too that the buddhist new year is extre- it is every it is it is the greatest celebration in yeah. asia all of asia in yeah. uh, well, chinese year is, is big and china is 15 day off so you're for New Year's Eve, you are celebrate for 15 days. And that's how big the holiday is. And I remember when the whole thing came down in China in the Buddha New Year or the Chinese New Year it happened, they were really concerned that people were going to start traveling everywhere. And they shut yep. that down too. And so yep. um, it, was, it was a real critical time. That it was probably about the worst time it could have been. Yeah, yeah it was happen. the worst time. Yeah. That's the biggest travel there because... Before that, there was the estimating around 300 million people travel doing for the holiday. Okay, so you mentioned your job revolves around you being on site and supervising, and you're working from home. So, like, how does your job work if you're working from home? Like, what do you do? Uh, you can't. <laughs> but my, most of my job is in the in, 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 on site. So, when I'm working from home. I really work trying hard to keep myself busy. Uh, I, you know, attending a lot of meetings and you know, be planning on the future projects, or you know, planning on the project that's gonna that gonna going to happen or continue to happen after the you know, whole after we are allowed back to work. Um, so really do all that planning and not much. I, you know, fit, not physically, not much going on. Um, so, yeah, I just try to find things to keep myself busy for the most of the time. Can I can I ask another question? Oh yeah, sure. is this is this Delaney? Yeah. Fire away, um, Delaney. So, what's been the what's been your biggest challenge during this whole? Thing? Aside from not being able to go out and live my normal life like everybody else. I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge to everybody is, you know, right now we are restricted and really confined into our apartment or what your house. Uh, that is really challenging. I think it's, it's the challenge is the same to everybody. Um, you know, we all wish to go back to live the normal life that we all know. Um, I, that's, that's pretty much it. I can't, I can think of anything. Thank you. No problem. I have one. Who is I? Mackenzie. Mackenzie, let it roll. Um, what have you been doing in your free time? Me? Watching a lot of TV on YouTube. <laughs> and YouTube, so that's pretty much it. I tried to pick up a book, but I can't. <laughs> can't, can't, can't sit down quietly watch read a book. I rarely post anything on my Facebook and, you know, where you want to talk into politics and stuff, but, you know, I, you know, that's why I work a lot of, you know, my colleagues and my, my friends that is not Asian or Chinese that ask me a question, which I appreciate it. You know, uh, if I feel like if they asking me a question, they respect my opinions. So, which is, you know, I, I'm glad they ask. So I just want to kind of get my record straight that, you know, here's the thing what I see over there. Um, the media here may not tell 100% truth or may not tell the whole perspective. This is what I feel. This is what I see, um, you know, you know, in turn of, you know, the, all the criticism go over there. I mean, yes, there is thing that we should criticize uh, to China government about, you know, first initial response or whatever. But at the same time, it's okay to say, you know, pat them in the back that you did some great job. And I don't, I don't see it's, it's a problem, you know, we, 
you know, they did something good that we should learn. We did something good they should learn. So it, it's, it's a learning a learning curve, especially when we come with a, a, a virus that nobody know about or, you know, we don't know about, or they don't know about, you know, in the first initial stage, you know, it's very close to New Year's, New Year's Day, so it's hard to make decisions. You, you're talking about any government body, you know, you know a, a mayor to make that decision to shut down a whole city. It's hard decision to anybody. Uh, so I kind of understand his difference, but, you know, but at the same time, like, it's, you know, nobody would thought it would become a pandemic. It's always easy to criticize somebody on hindsight. After every happen, we say, oh, you should do that, you should do that. But when you try to put yourself in their shoes to think, and you would know that how hard that decision was and why they try to do the work, that do what they did. And, you know, at least to me, I see them, they know they're, they're, at least to me in China, and I see them, they're notice they're making a big mistake and they willing to fix it quick. And I think that is worth something that, I mean, at least we should give them a, a you know, at least a, not, not a good job, but at least, a, you know, you, you did something right, you know, not complete, a, a fall, a everything. Is that what's the first thing he wants to do when all this is over? Going, going to Russia, he, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, Right now we're we've been staying home for 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 four months, so we really miss the food in especially in Chicago area. Got a lot of restaurants we need, we haven't been to, so we're looking forward to that. Cool. I may have missed it. How many have uh, actually died in China? I'm not sure the exact number right now. I have to check, um, but you know. But I guess it's a lot less. Um, what you know, that's just something that I post on on Facebook the other day. Is that you know there is never a a universal way to count death by COVID nineteen. Um, every country do it differently. Um, but if you think about, I think China used a way that they only count people who directly die from the virus which means if I'm a healthy person, I got virus and I die, that is directly. But if you're like, say you have underlying disease, you got virus and pass away, they might not count that. So to, to a lot of, you know, question about if the number accurate or not, it really based on how each country define the number recorded. So, you know, to find out the actual number, you actually never know. Yeah, that's been be a problem all over the world. Everybody's using different standards. Um, yeah, especially early on in 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 the, in the virus the breakout that nobody you know China doesn't have a test kit in the early on. So only way to diagnostic it is, you know, you CT scan them, you you te- you do a bunch of tests, and you get your te- te- test result. You know, a couple of t- days later. Um, you don't have this test kit that will show result in a day or in a few hours. So it took a lot of work and the hospital over there just overwhelmed um, in every single hospital over there. So they turn away a lot of patients, turn away a lot of people because they just can't handle it. And those people might pass away in their home. They might recover that never get recorded. Cool. We really, really, really appreciate your insights to this um, pandemic. I mean, you bring something to the table here that is so, uh, it's rich with so many different angles. Um, thanks a lot, Jiao Wei. Thank you so much. Um, next week, next week on Coping with COVID, we will have Dominique Jessen, who graduated in 2014, I think it was. She's working for United Way in Muskegon. And she is involved with the volunteer effort to get people out into the community to help people that are in trouble. Make sure you guys stop by China Star and uh, pick up pick up a good takeout. 
uh, and check out all the PPE and the plexiglass and the new setup and, um, and know that Zhao Wei drove over from Chicago and helped put that stuff together. So thanks so much, Zhao Wei. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks, everybody. thanks for being patient with me, uh, having trouble getting this thing going early. Uh, make sure that you get your assignment in and uh, we'll see you uh, soon. Take care. Enjoy the sunshine, guys. Have a good weekend. Mr. Wood. Yes. My dad wants to say hi. Oh, your dad, was your dad here for this? I was there at the beginning and then I had to get my exercise in, of course. And now I'm back for the end. I want to say hello Mr. to Joe. Hi. How are yeah. you? Good, how are you? Good, good to see you. First time Mr. Coletta has stopped by to us because Ty Coletta would never let his dad show his face in his say in his shared Zoom. That's Why? true. <laughs> he wouldn't let me into his domain here and his <laughs> room. And just by the way, we got takeout the other night from Giant Star. Thank you. <laughs> Even this guy tried tried it for the first time. Uh, can you believe it? Right. Oh, orange chicken. Whoa! Went out on a big limb. Like <laughs> yeah.